Thank you for this introduction. Um, I'm David Ruprecht, and this is joint work with Katarina Coles, Torsten Holtz, and Christina Pepper. So um, the first three hours are from Ruhr University Bochum, and Christina is from NYU Abu Dhabi. So um, yeah, it's about LTE, and we use LTE on a daily basis. So it is um, expected that we have, of the world population, 75% are using L LTE in 2020 on a daily basis. And we use it for various scenarios, for sharing with our friends or yeah, phoning with our parents. So we need to secure the communication, in particular the radio communication, between your phone and the network. So LTE has some standard security aims, like mutual authentication between your phone and the network, traffic confidentiality that secures the connection or does encryption, and some special um, aims like identity and location confidentiality. To reach the security aims, we have first initial authentication and key agreement protocol that establish mutual authentication between your phone and the network and also a common key. This common key is used for ongoing security measures um, and secure the connection. We want to look, have, have a closer look today at what kind of security um, is implemented in the security connections, in particular, where is this implemented and what kind of security measures are implemented. And this brings me to the layer two of LTE. Um, this is a data link layer and here are the security implemented for the radio layer connection. In, in particular, the PDCP sub-protocol implements the security he here. We need to know that there are no security measures below this layer, and we want to know what kind of security measures are implemented at the PDCP. First, we need to separate our data in two kind of planes. So we have a control plane. This is LTE-specific traffic, um, like when we hand over from one cell to another, this is done by the control plane. And we have user plane traffic, that is basically your raw IP data when we went, want to access a website or do some TV streaming. So on both planes we have encryption and we have integrity protection only on the control plane and not on the user plane. So today I want to talk about three major attacks that happen, can happen on layer two. First of all, I want to do an identity mapping attack, which allows us to use a public identifier and map it down to the radio identity. We have metadata on layer two that allows website fingerprinting, and, oh, one for, and we wanna, I want to introduce the alter attack, which allows us to redirect a victim to a malicious website due to missing integrity protection. So first I want to start with an identity mapping. This allows us to use a public identity to map down to the radio identity. So we have certain different identities in LTE. First, we have the public identity of the victim. For example, the phone's phone number of your friend. And it's basically lifelong. It, you might change it, but you will at least yeah, give your friends your no, new phone number. So, and it's basically on layer eight, so we can identify each other from UE, which is the phone in LTE, to UE. Then we have the permanent identity, which, which is called IMSI, and this is only private between your phone and the core network. So there should be no attacker available of this um, IMSI. We have also some, for privacy reasons, we have also already some temporary identity called TIMSI. And related work has already shown that we can basically map the phone number of the UE um, to the IMSI and even down to the temporary identity. We have a third, or, yeah, third LTE specific um, identity, which is a radio identity. This is called RNTI. And this is only active during um, an active radio connection, so only when you send active data to the radio connection, the RNTI is used and associated with your phone and the data. So as I said earlier, we have already seen some related work where we can map the phone number to the IMSI and map the phone number to the TIMSI. 
What we want to show you today is how to map the TIMSI to the RNTI, which is used on layer two. And the idea is quite simple. So when our phone wants to connect to a phone, it initiates a radio connection. The E node B, or the base station of the network, assigns us, or the phone, an RNTI. To be precise, this is called CRNTI, which is used only for this radio connection. To let the user or the network know who we actually are, we use a TIMSI. And we can now use an uplink sniffer um, on this message to link the CRNTI with a TIMSI. However, uplink sniffing is LTE, in LTE is difficult. It's, I would say it's not impossible, but you really need um, good hardware equipment to do synchronization on the radio layer, and um, in particular, the timing advance is quite difficult here. However, there's one specification problem, I would say, that allows us to use also a downlink sniffer because um, the E node B sends back the TIMSI for collision avoidance during the first phase of this thing. So we did this and, um, in a commercial network and we see this is actually possible. I want now to present you the website fingerprinting attack. So once we have learned the CRNTI of a user, we could, can do website fingerprinting with it. The idea is quite simple, um, and we know website fingerprinting from other contexts, like Tor or HTTPS website fingerprinting, and we can do it on encrypted traffic. However, as it's new to the context of LTE, and we can do it because there is unencrypted layer two metadata available in LTE. So the thing is quite easy. So we have a training set where we can learn or pre-record data of visiting website, and then we have an attack phase where we record actually the user traffic and then map both together. So we have a classification attack, and when we guess the site correctly, the attack was successful. So we did this in our work right now as a first proof, concept, proof of concept work in a um, controlled lab setup and with simple scenarios, and we got a success rate about 95%. And we got also some real-world feasibility studies um, on a follow-up paper um, where we did this in a commercial network where we also look into influencing factors like use browser, use baseband chipset, so if we use an iPhone or an Android device, and how we compare these both together. And um, I refer here to the paper, Lost Traffic Encryption, presented last week at WISEC. So I want to not now talk about the alter attack. So um, this is an active attack. So both before ones were passive attacks. And this is a passive active attack on layer two, um, which allows us to redirect a victim to, the, to a malicious website, for example. We have three components of this attack. First of all, we can modify the plain text. The man in the middle attack is what we are kind of using as an active attacker in this, um, in this scenario. And one example of this is DNS spoofing. Um, I want to first introduce you the plain text modification in LTE. As I said earlier, there is no integrity protection to the user plane. And this happens on the PDCP layer. However, the traffic is encrypted. So we want to now look how the traffic is actually encrypted in LTE, in particular for the user plane. We need to know that the PDCP protocol encrypts the whole IP packet. So there is no IP header left that can be used for, for at the attacker's side. Um, we use a stream cipher um, mainly in the main, yeah, in commercial networks. This is often AES in counter mode to do a simple stream cipher where we XOR the key stream with the plain text and get the cipher text out of it. The sender sends now the uh, ciphertext, and this might intercept it by an active attacker. The active attacker can now uh, modify the ciphertext by simply XORing some mask on it and forward the manipulated ciphertext to the receiver. The receiver has no means to control any, um, on any modification of the ciphertext and also decrypts it with the same exact same key stream as the sender did. So we got the manipulated plain text that has the same bit flips in the, um, in the plain text as introduced by the attacker with the mask. The interesting fact is that we can now 
basically do a known plain text attack where we can, um, where we have the plain text and deterministically um, get the manipulated plain text out of it by simply XORing the wanted plain text with the um, wanted uh, with the known plain text. I want now to introduce the active man in the middle. Obviously, we need an active man in the middle to intercept these messages. And for LTE, this was the tricky part. So I want to give you a rough idea of the requirements and want not to go into detail of the implementation. So first of all, the active man in the middle needs to act as an E node B towards the victim, towards the phone, and act as UE, so as phone, to the commercial network. This all happens on layer two, and he needs to forward layer two frames on both sides. So we implemented such relay with the open source LTE stack of software radio system, which is available on GitHub. And this is actually how our experiment looked like. We put the UE in a shielding box to prevent enter in any interference with any outside commercial network. And we have an enode B component and the UE component using um, software-defined radios. We implemented this relay on a normal computer uh, running Linux. Um, so as one example of manipulating the cipher text, we per can perform DNS spoofing DNS spoofing attack. The interesting fact on DNS is that LTE, the LTE network sets the DNS request um, or the, sets the DNS server at the beginning of each connection. So an attacker can easily guess the plain text of, of this DNS requests. Further, DNS requests are easily identifiable by its length. So we can easily distinguish between DNS request packets and normal TCP traffic. This is why we choose to use DNS as one target. I will roughly go through the whole process, the attack procedure. In particular, we have on the left side the victim, the relay, the commercial network, and the internet here. So the UE will connect to our relay so we assume this, but it has related work has shown this is possible. It's basically a normal IMSI catcher attack. And performs, uh, and performs the attach procedure, attach procedure. So the relay forwards all messages, including the AKA. At this time, both entities, so the commercial network and the UE, are mutually authenticated on layer three. And um, so there is mutual authentication established between both entities. However, the relay forwards all traffic on layer two. So there will be one time there, the, the UE will send in DNS request and the relay will intercept this DNS request based on a length. It will XOR the mask and this right, um, directs the IP packet to the malicious DNS server. The DNS server, the malicious DNS server will respond with the DNS spoofing um, packet towards the UE. However, the relay will also intercept this me message and alter the source IP address back to the original DNS destination address because um, the UE needs to match the outgoing packet into the, with the incoming packet. All subsequent messages, so in particular the HTTP connection, is directed towards the HTTP server under control of the attacker. So we have done this in a commercial network using a commercial phone with a commercial SIM card with a self-built relay and we were able basically to redirect a victim which want to go to a website, we used Hotmail as one example, to a, malicious, um, to, to a normal website, redirect it um, to a malicious website where we basically could, could steal the credentials. <coughs> The question is how we can prevent this attack, obviously with integrity protection, and in particular on the user plane. LTE is now fully deployed, fully specified, and we all use it. 
So to be honest, it will be unlikely that there will any change on LTE. However, 5G, the upcoming promising new radio technology, um, is still under specification for certain parts. And um, it will be rolled out soon. So there is still optional um, integrity protection on the user plane. And early implementations might have limited support of this uh, integrity protection on the user plane. So the attack vector remains open in current and maybe also for future generations. I would come to now to my conclusion. First, I've shown you an identity mapping attack where we can match the public identity to the radio identity. Website fingerprinting was possible because we have unencrypted metadata in LTE. And third, I showed you the alter attack, which allows the redirection of a user to a malicious website. I'm David Ruprecht from Ruhr University, Bochum, and I'm happy to answer you any questions. All right, any questions? Just please come to the microphones uh, in, in the walkway. Uh, I have the pleasure of getting to ask the first question. So we've seen a few papers uh, over the course of this conference and over time over looking at, for instance, like HTTPS everywhere at true end-to-end -end authentication. Yeah. Like, does that factor in at all in terms of defenses? Like, why wouldn't that have, for instance, you know, identified maybe the user in the attack that you had demonstrated? So the question is if there are upper layer um, countermeasures against it. Yeah, obviously there are. For example, you can use HTTPS with secure cookie policy and so on. However, we have, I think we have um, seen that also attacks on this layer can happen. So what my idea of a secure communication system is that we have from the ground on a secure connection that one might one um, layer fail. For example, LTE, we have another layer of, of, of protection against it. So um, yeah, that's why we kind of request also integrity protection needed in, on the user plane. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Tom Benjamin, Perspective Labs. I've got a question about the number one there, the identity mapping. Could yes. you pop back in your slides? I, know uh, I hope, yes, I can. <laughs> no, it's way back in the slideshow. Yeah. But I was just uh, interested in the link between uh, the TMSI yeah. and, uh, and the, the RINTI. Yeah. Um, I, I might not have uh, been understanding I think, what you're yeah, saying, which is why it, I want to. It might be take a while until I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. But you can but ask. So, so, the, so the question I was going to be asking yeah. is, uh, so right there oh, oh, okay. uh, with the, well, okay, so oh. this is for the collision avoidance. Yeah. But earlier, were you saying that you are, um, at least for this way of identifying the user's rent yeah. that you're expecting that you know the TMSI? Yes, and um, so we are we are thinking about, so the attacker model is like, um, you know the TIMZ from previous attacks and then can link the TIMZ to, to the RNTI. Um, however, we can also, we saw some related work that, for example, the TIMZ is not really allocated in a random way and the RNTI is not re allocated in a ran random way, like there are subsequent numbers. And so, so the problem of fear is having um, not randomized identities along with mapping identities not in, in, in a non-deterministic way or in a deterministic way. Okay, good. That was going to be my question was yeah. whether we were assuming that the yeah. TMSI was not going to have good randomness. Yes. Uh, yes. So, in, yes. so I see. So yeah. we're saying that this is an, an uh, implementation problem rather than a protocol problem. Yes, I think it always depends on implementation and specifications. So there is a specification who says, okay, the NTI, uh, the TIMSI needs to be randomized sufficiently, but, but there's the Guti reallocation paper presented last or yeah. the year before, I don't know. Yeah, that was so, my only yeah, question, yeah, whether yeah, it's yeah, specification yeah, or implementation. Yeah, both, both, Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's thank our speaker once more.